today we're going to be talking about work, energy, and power. And so work is going to be represented by a capital W for the variable and the unit on work, I guess we'll see in a second. So the formula for work is force dot distance. And so uh, there's a lot going on in this equation. So uh, you'll notice I drew this multiplication dot extra large. So this is a dot product. So it's a special kind of multiplication that uh, you use between two vectors. And it can be, uh, it can get more complicated, but for this class, we're just gonna say that this dot product means that you take the magnitude of each of these vectors, multiply them together, and then multiply by the cosine of the angle between them. So if you had a, so I guess we'll look at a couple of examples on the next slide, uh, but Another thing to notice is that this work variable is a scalar. So another word for this dot product, or another way to think about the dot product is that you take two vectors into your multiplication and the output is a scalar term. So remember, scalar doesn't have a direction associated with it, uh, but your vectors have a magnitude and a direction. And then if we look at the units for work, so we have the units for force, which are Newtons, and then we have the unit for this. Uh, so I guess I can label these. So this is force, this is distance or displacement. And that has units of meters. So the unit for work is Newton meter. Okay, so let's show a couple of examples of what this dot product would look like. So if we have work, like this, and we wanna say, so let's do a couple of examples. So let's draw our first picture like this, where the force and the distance are like that. And now let's have another example where the force is down and the displacement is also down. Okay, so if we want to know the work done in picture one by force one acting along this distance D1, then we take our dot product and we turn it into this multiplying the magnitudes and then cosine of the angle between them. So this is the angle theta. And now the work done would be 
cosine of theta, which is 90. And so the work done in this picture one is zero because cosine of 90 is zero. So then if we look at the second example, so work two, verse two, distance two, and then because these are in the same direction, the angle between them is zero. Now the cosine of zero is equal to one, and so we get that we just multiply the magnitude of these two vectors together. So if things are, if your vectors are perpendicular, then your dot product will go to zero. So And then if you're Vectors are pointed in the same direction. Then yeah. that product is not zero and it's just the multiplying the magnitude of your two forces to get our two vectors together. Any questions about that? Okay. So these are two examples, but what about when the But if this was our force and this was our direction, and now the angle between them is no longer zero or 90, but it's some other angle that's in between. So in this case, the, so our equation still works. And now the only subtlety is uh, what direction do we measure the angle theta in? So if you think about it, you could measure the angle theta going this way, or you could measure the angle theta going the opposite way. And so whether that angle is, depending on which way you measure the, the angle, you could get a negative sign inside of your cosine and that might affect your answer. So the way that we're gonna measure it is you always start from the first vector in your dot product and you measure counterclockwise from that vector to the second vector to get what theta is. So just as an example, if I switched these two vectors, now the magnitude of this angle might be the same, but because we're measuring from 
the force to to the displacement vector, now our angle would have to be either this much larger angle. So let's say, for example, that this first data that we measured was, let's say, 30 degrees. Then in the second example, theta would have to be 360 minus 30, which would be 330 degrees. Or if you measured it the other way, you could get theta equals negative 30 degrees. And so if you plugged both of those into cosine, you would get the same result. Um, if you plugged the blue, uh, each of those blue ones in, you would get the same result. Uh, sorry. If you plug negative 30 into your cosine or you plug 330 into your cosine, <clears throat> you would get the same result. But if you plug positive 30 into your cosine, it would be not the, the correct answer. So you have to be careful about how you measure this angle theta. That's uh, just a distance. Yeah. Yeah, so distance is just the magnitude of displacement. So displacement is a some distance and what direction that distance is in. Any questions? All right. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we've already seen how this work ties in to force. And now we're going to relate this work to energy. Water? And so to do that, we're now gonna introduce energy. So that'll be written with a capital E for its vector. And it's going to have the same units as work. So its units are Newton meter. And there are going to be two different types of energy. So there's going to be a kinetic energy. Well, there are many types of energy, but for this class, we'll focus on uh, kinetic energy and potential energy. So I'll write this one as capital KE. And then potential energy, I guess you could write it as PE, but it's usually written as U for the variable name. <clears throat> and then the formula for kinetic energy is always the same. It's always gonna be one half M V squared, where M is the mass of the object and V is the velocity, but it's, this is a, a scalar. So when you square this velocity, you get rid of the, the vector sign. So this, you could also think of this as speed instead. I feel like this is saying hard stuff. And then we'll see uh, some examples of potential energies in a second. But we can check the units on this kinetic energy. So 
mass has units of kilogram. If we square the units of velocity, that would be meter per second. And then we square both of those things. So this is kilogram meters squared over second squared. The units for Newton are kilogram meter per second squared. So this is the same thing as Newton meter. So another way that you'll see this unit written is with a capital J and that stands for joules. So joules are the same thing as Newton times meter, which is the same thing as kilogram times meter squared divided by second squared. So let's now use our equation for work that we had and we'll find uh, one specific example of potential energy. So if we look at the potential energy due to gravity, And to start with, we'll be talking about gravity that's close to the Earth. So if we look at the work done by gravity, then we would take the force of gravity times some distance, and we would multiply those together in a dot product. So if you imagine you have some object that's falling down. Then the force of gravity and the uh, direction that the object is moving are in the same direction. So this work would become force, the magnitude of force of gravity times the magnitude of the distance times the cosine of the angle between them. And the, co the angle is zero. So cosine of zero goes to one. And you're left with just Fg times the distance. We know that the force of gravity equals Mg. And then if we replace so this distance is occurring in the y direction and we usually call distances in the y direction h. So the work done by gravity equals mgh and we define this mgh as the potential energy due to gravity. So energy and work are kind of, uh, they're very closely related and they're kind of two sides of the same point. Yes. So this is just a height. So I, I replaced the distance d with height because distance we usually call distances in the in the y direction height. Mass times the force of gravity times length. Uh, this is the acceleration due to gravity, right? Nine point eight. 
So while we have this fresh in our minds before we move on to other kinds of potential energies, uh, I want to show you an example and why we care about energy in the first place. So the reason we care about energy is that there is a law of conservation of energy. So in words, uh, that's energy is neither created nor destroyed, but only changes from one form to another. And mathematically, we can write all of that into one equation that says that energy initial equals energy final. And so on the next slide, I'll show you an example of how we apply this conservation law and use it to solve problems. So if we think about an example of, say, a ball falling from some height, and we want to know what the final velocity is before it hits the ground, or like right before it hits the ground. So we've seen that we can do this using kinematic equations, and I'll do that uh, maybe I'll do that first. So we want to find the final velocity here. We're given the height. We know the acceleration. So I'm going to use this equation. Okay, so if we're dropping this thing, we're assuming that the initial velocity is zero. The, so solving for the final velocity, it's already by itself. We just need to take the square root of the other side. And then let's say we gave some numbers here. Let's say the height was two meters. And then we know the acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.8. Delta Y is negative two because Y final minus Y initial. So final is zero because it ends on the ground. Initial is two. So that's how you get your negative two and your Delta Y. And so you get a final velocity of six point three meters per second. Okay, so now we're going to look. Yeah. So delta y is negative because of what's over here on the right hand side. So delta y is y final minus y initial. So if this thing is falling down, it starts at some height and then it ends up at the ground at zero. 
So I put final velocity is zero, or final uh, height is zero, initial height was two, and then when I subtract those, I get negative two. Okay, so, so let's do this now with energy conservation. So if you're doing energy conservation, you always start off writing this statement. And now if you, uh, if it helps, you can write out all of your energy terms. So initial kinetic energy plus initial potential energy has to equal final kinetic energy plus final potential energy. So if we're starting this thing at an initial velocity of zero, then if we look at our equation for kinetic energy, The initial velocity is zero, so we have no initial kinetic energy. So this term goes away. Our, our equation for the potential energy due to gravity was mgh. So in our initial picture, we are at some height h, that was two meters. So we're gonna have some potential energy. At the end, when we hit the ground, uh, we are moving at some final velocity. So we're gonna have some final kinetic energy. And then if we're at the ground, we're at a height of zero. So we have no potential energy. So now if we solve this equation for final velocity, you'll see that the mass cancels out. And if I move everything around and then take the square root, you'll see that this is the same thing that we had before. So this energy conservation approach works for similar problems to what we've seen before. Uh, there are limitations, however. So in your conservation of energy, you don't see any time running around anywhere. So if a problem asks you, how long does this process take? You wouldn't be able to use conservation of energy to figure that out. Also, because these energies are all uh, scalars, you couldn't find a vector quantity using conservation of energy. So like in your exam yesterday, you were asked to find the impact, the X and Y components of the impact velocity. You couldn't do that using this conservation of energy. You have to use the kinematic equations because those are all vectors. So these approaches, will give similar results, but you have to know when you can use one versus when you can use the other. So any questions about this uh, conservation of energy approach? And you'll see more examples of this in your PLTL tomorrow and in the homework that we work on this week. Okay, so now let's keep talking about uh, different kinds of potential energy. 
So we've already seen the potential energy due to gravity close to the earth was MGH. And the process that we used to derive this was using the work, uh, using work to figure out what the potential energy is. You can do the same thing to get these other potential energies, but it involves using calculus. So the, that's not something you need to know how to do for this class. Uh, but I mention that because the results might look a little bit strange or there's extra terms that you don't necessarily know where they're coming from. So if you remember, we talked about springs and we said that the spring force was equal to K and then delta X. And depending on how you define everything, there might be a negative sign in front of this. But so this basically said, if you start with a spring that has some initial length, uh, I guess let's call it some initial X zero, let's say the initial length was one meter. And then if you stretch that spring, so that it's now at a length of two meters, then this delta x is just x final minus minus x initial. So in this little picture that I drew, that would be two minus one. So that would be a delta X of one. So if you did the same process that we did before where you took your force and you multiplied it by the distance that the spring was stretched by, you could find the work and you might think that the work is gonna be the same as the potential energy. And that's close, but uh, there's gonna be an extra factor of one half out in front. And this extra one half factor comes from uh, calculus. So again, you don't need to know why it has the extra one half in front, but if you were curious, it's because of calculus, uh, but just make sure you include it when you are using your potential energy. So another force that we've seen is the force of gravity when things are orbiting the earth. And that was capital G M1 M2 over R squared in the radial direction. And so this is also going to have a potential energy associated with it. I'll call it U capital G. is because of calculus. So just like we used the, this conservation law with our kinetic energy and our potential energy close to the earth, we can use that conservation law with any of these potential energies 
combined combined with our kinetic energy. Right, so the, the negative sign in front of the K for the, the spring potential energy uh, is going to go away uh, because the, the potential energy, uh, maybe I, I can explain that in an example. So if we look at an example using the spring, and then we'll do an example with the uh, other kind of potential energy or gravity. So if we look at a spring using conservation of energy. And so we've kind of seen something like this already with our little uh, projectile launching lab where you had a spring that shot a uh, marble into a, and made it do uh, some kind of projectile motion. So if we take a simplified version of that and we, okay, so before we put the marble in front of the spring, the spring had some length that we'll call L. And then when we wanted to launch our marble, we compressed that spring so that it was now some shorter length that we would call L minus L1. I guess. And so we compress that spring and then we let the spring go. So this is kind of a rest position. This is our initial position. And then if we want to know what the velocity of the marble was, when we launch that projectile, we can use energy conservation to figure that out. Oh, there's no vector. So in our initial picture, the So we have, you can always write down kinetic plus potential equals kinetic plus potential. So initially this thing is not moving. So there's no kinetic energy. Because there's a spring here, we know there's going to be some potential energy due to the spring. And then in our final picture, uh, the ball is not touching the spring anymore. So there's going to be no potential energy due to the spring. And it's going to be all kinetic energy. So now this delta x is x final minus x initial. Our final position was L minus L1. Or no, that's our initial position. Our final position would be back at L. Our initial position was L minus L1. 
So we get delta x equals L1, or yeah, L1. And so when we plug that into our equation, now we can solve for the final velocity. So you'll see your one halves cancel. And the final velocity would be the square root of k l1 squared over n. Or you might see it as square root of k over m times l. So the reason that there's no negative sign in front of the uh, potential spring energy is that the potential energy of the spring is a, like we want that to be a positive so that all of this math works out. Okay, so then let's, To the other kind of gravity now. So this was Newtonian gravity. And we wrote down its potential energy as negative g m1 m2 over r. And so the reason that this one is negative is that if you So if we made a graph, so conceptually, because this is a one over R uh, term, the farther away, so as R increases, one over R decreases. Right? But if we get further away from the surface of the Earth, if we were looking at our other if we were looking at our other potential energy, MGH, as H gets bigger, our potential energy gets bigger, right? So as we get farther away from the Earth, our potential energy needs to be getting bigger. So if we just, if we didn't have this minus sign out in front, then as we got farther away from the earth, our potential energy would decrease. So that doesn't make sense conceptually. But if we have this minus sign out in front, now as R increases, the negative of one over R also increases. Because if we, so one over R gets smaller, that means it's getting closer to zero. But if it's a negative number, a negative number getting closer to zero means that it's increasing, right? So uh, there's a calculus reason for why there's a negative sign in front here, but there's also a um, just conceptual reason why there needs to be a negative sign up. So if we do now the same kind of conservation of energy with uh, this Newtonian gravity, kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial plus kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. And we wanted to know how fast do we need to go to escape Earth or whatever surface we're on 
we want to know what V is such that R goes to infinity. So our initial kinetic energy is one half mv initial squared. Our initial potential energy is negative g m1 m2 over r. Now let's say that we, if we're launching from the earth and we we have a limited amount of fuel that we can bring with us, then we're gonna choose our escape velocity such that we just barely make it away. Like we don't have any extra velocity left over. So then this term goes to zero. And then if R goes to infinity, one or G M one, so G M one M two over infinity, this term goes to zero. So if you divide something by a really big number, you get something that approaches zero. So this term would also go to zero. So if we solved this equation for that velocity, and this is the escape velocity, then you get B equals square root G M R. And then there's a factor of two. And so, like I said, this is the velocity that you would need to escape Earth if you were launching your rocket or something. And then using the logic that I introduced when we were talking about black holes, if the maximum velocity is the speed of light C, and we replace that in our equation, then we can calculate the radius of a black hole by rearranging this equation for C. And then this R might be written as a capital R. This is the mass of the black hole. This is the speed of light. And this is the gravitational constant. And then just one more thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, so we talked about work, energy, and then power. Power is just the rate of change of energy over time. And it has units of watts. And then a watt is the same thing as a joule per second. And then we remember that joule was kilogram meter squared per second squared. And so this is the same thing as kilogram meter squared per second. So all of these units are, the, are equivalent to each other. <laughs> 